Coming up, the rumble in the Amazon jungle. Orion is back in town. Boeing completes some paperwork. Plus, we talk with Boss Lonsdorp, the co-founder and CEO of Mars One. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Welcome to Tomorrow, episode 7.37 for Saturday, December 13th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me is a beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham, and we'll be your hosts for this episode. Uh, before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to all the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. I also want to give a huge shout out to the new citizens this week, Trent and Doug. Thank you guys so much for being premier patrons of Tomorrow. You can find more information on how you can help crowdfund the show over at patreon.com slash tmro. All right, there is one boatload unit of space news, so let's go ahead and get started with that. First up, uh, last week, right around this exact time, Arion Space was busy doing this. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage de ZAP. And off she goes. That's an Ariane 5 ECA launch Saturday, December 6th at 2040. Coordinated time that had direct TV. It's going to be uh, giving additional U.S. satellite service to the U.S. and parts of uh, Puerto Rico, I believe. Uh, hopefully 4K service. I believe they're launching some of those birds soon. As well as GSAT 16, which is an IRS ISRO satellite for India. It's a telecommunications and emergency services satellite. And in just a moment, our favorite rock star announcer. The Amazon jungle is the mighty Ariane 5 as it roars into the skies above Karu. My seventh time I've had a chance to be here. I love this dude. Every time. He, he is my favorite sports, I mean, rocket announcer of all time. It's so much fun to listen to him get excited about the rocket launches. Uh, so, yeah, that happened. Uh, and then a little bit later on, China actually launched a trio of satellites. Now, as per normal China standard operating <laughs> procedure, uh, these are, um, I forgot how they worded. I just stopped putting it in the show notes. They basically say, we're helping look at crop yields, but they, no one believes that. Um, this is Yalgen 25. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. These are images from the launch because uh, I had the video, but it was just, it was as useless as the other videos that you guys have seen. Uh, tracking data from the U.S. Air, they said it was one satellite. Uh, tracking data from the U.S. Uh, Air Force's Space Surveillance Network said there were about three of them or so. They be are believed to monitor worldwide naval activity. This is the 14th launch of China in 2014, so more than one launch per month. That is a great launch cadence. Go them, on the, Yeah, go them. Uh, rock, rock on, China. So there you go, uh, military satellites launched. Uh, we, speaking of military satellites, boom. Three, two, we have RD-180 ignition, and we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the NRO L-35 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. There you go, that was an Atlas V. It launched December 12th at 319 Coordinated Universal Time from Vandenberg. Uh, because it's NRO um, National Reconnaissance Office, uh, it is a classified satellite. We don't know what it is. This was the most powerful Atlas vehicle ever launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. It flew in the 541 configuration. The 5 means it's a 5 meter fairing. The 4 means there were 4 solid strap-on boosters. And the 1 means that there was 1... Um, uh, one Centaur engine on the upper stage, so 541, that's, that is not a small rocket that they launched. Um, Vandenberg's first Atlas launch was actually a ballistic missile that launched in September 9, 1959. Fun, there's a fun factoid for everyone. Oh, uh, this was the ninth, fun facts. Fun, more fun facts, ninth Atlas V launch of 2014. Oh, wow. That's... So rock, rock on, Atlas V. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so Orbital is going to be launching a Cygnus uh, uh, space station's resupply mission atop an Atlas V rocket, which is very, very cool. There's an awesome picture there for you. Uh, the flight is scheduled for the fourth quarter of 2015, so hopefully right around this time 
Next year, Atlas V launcher will take off from Cape Canaveral's Complex Launch 41, uh, not from Wallops, which is significant. Atlas V rocket will fly in the 401 configuration, which has been uh, so eloquently just described as a 4-meter rocket, no solid boosters, and one Cygnus engine. Orbital hopes that the redesigned Antares rocket with a few with a new first stage propulsion system will be ready to begin flights in the first quarter of 2016. Uh, the contract with ULA includes an option for an additional Atlas V launch in 2016 if the upgraded Antares rocket is not ready to resume flights. The switch to the new engine and price of purchasing an unplanned Atlas V will come at no extra cost to NASA. I should have said that in my best Billy Mays impression. <laughs> <laughs> How much will you pay for this extra launch? You will cost nothing. nothing. Okay. <laughs> well, this all this all comes from the Antares launch failure, right? Yes. So we lost Antares. Orbital went ah. We still have to get payload up to the International Space yeah, Station. We still have to so do this now somehow. they're going to take Cygnus and drop it on top of an Atlas V. And of course, you're not going to take an Atlas V and stick it on Pad Zero and Wallops. It would destroy the pad. So they're launching it from Space Launch Complex Forty One not Waltz, which makes a ton of sense. So there you go. That's what's happening with uh, um, Orbital Sciences and uh, Cygnus. Uh, speaking of spacecraft, Orion, that launch that happened not that long ago, yeah. back on land. Yay. Check it out. Uh, this is the USS Anchorage. It it's arrived in San Diego. It's the coolest flipping picture I've ever seen. I ever. know. Like, that is so badass. It's like an entire, I don't even know. It's like a warehouse on the water. It's so, um, as soon as I saw this, I was just speechless. As I am now, which is why I should stop talking. <laughs> it was 600 miles from where it splashed down back to San Diego. You can see the, um, I'm pointing, the, the there you go, the They're Orion spacecraft cool. sitting inside of it. And then the next picture I think is my favorite. This picture, there it is. There's the USS <laughs> Anchorage and San Diego, San Diego. It makes San Diego look like a tiny city. <laughs> sitting in the background, there's a spaceship on that boat. That's so cool. There's a... I suppose it'd be a ship. It wouldn't be a boat. And yeah, uh, and there you go. There's the uh, there's the spacecraft being taken off of uh, USS Anchorage. Um, so there you go. Now before it heads back to Kennedy Space Center, they're going to take the flight computers out, pop it open, take out the flight computers because they need to analyze that data as fast as possible because NASA needs to make a report in the next ninety days on it. <laughs> yeah, I know. So there, NASA's like. We need the data! Fast! So, yeah, they're going to do that. They're also potentially going to be looking at the heat shield and right. uh, how it pay, uh, fared on re-entry because that was a 22,000 mile per hour uh, re-entry. Nice. That spacecraft is actually going to fly again. That is a reusable spacecraft. Nice. Orion, that exact craft will fly on a launch abort test in 2018 that's going to sit atop a peacemeaser... Peacemeaser... Peacemaker missile donated by the Air Force. A peacekeeper missile? A peace... Keeper. What did I say? Peacemaker. Peacemaker. Whatever. And it just gonna, shoots it's out. It's going to make peace. <laughs> Peacekeeper. <laughs> uh, Orion sits on, that Orion sits on top of that, and they're going to do a launch abort test uh, to actually make sure that, you know, it works. Yeah, that'll like be they, very cool. Like they expect. Yeah, that, hopefully we'll get some video of that. That'll yeah. be uh, that'll be am amazing uh, footage. Uh, NASA gets a potential funding boost. Check this out. Uh, the Senate, uh, Senate Appropriations Committee has the omnibus spending bill, which adds $365 million to NASA's budget, bringing them at about just over $18 billion for fiscal year 15. Uh, it has includes a $100 million mission to Jupiter's moon Europa, Yay. which is awesome. Planetary science has actually fared very well in this, yeah. which is one of those areas of NASA that I, th I feel like we keep stealing from planetary sciences yeah. to feed SLS. Right. And I'm, I'm happy that we've kind of slowed that down or mm -hmm. possibly stopped it. We kind of started shoveling a little bit more money back towards planetary sciences. Uh, it does boost NASA's budget over Obama's requested $17.46 billion, which is a, just under a $550 million difference uh, between what Obama requested and what they're potentially going to be getting. Yeah. Uh, so here's how this breaks down. Uh, science is getting $272 million more, which brings them at $5.2 billion. Nice. Exploration gets $380 million more, which brings them in at $4.3 billion, and that kind of further breaks down the exploration category. You've got the Space Launch System. It's getting $320 million more than they had asked for it at $1.7 uh, $1 billion. Uh, you've got Orion getting $141 million more than requested at $1.1 billion per year. However, this does come out of a cost. Commercial crew is getting $43 million less than requested at $805 million, which, 
does kind of suck a little bit. So we're shoveling yeah. more money at SLS and Orion, but we're actually not giving... Now, we've underfunded Commercial Crew forever. For, yeah, from the So I, that's not necessarily new, but if we were throwing money at all these programs, it would have been nice if they could fully fund Commercial Crew. Uh, interesting that all of Commercial Crew, all, like, the both of the vehicles, the whole thing, costs less than the one Orion. I'll just throw that out there. I'm just saying that it costs less than just Orion. Yeah. But, you know, there's that. Now, this hasn't actually passed yet. The Senate still needs to vote on this in the next few days, but it is expected to actually pass. There you go. Uh, one other thing that happened, remember the RD-180 fiasco? D the debacle of debac the decade? The debacle of the RD-180. Here's a picture <laughs> of an RD-180. This is the engine that sits underneath the Atlas V rocket. We just saw an Atlas V lift off from Vandenberg. It used those, en well, not those exact, that, that type of engine right there, an RD-180. <laughs> those are not the engines on that vehicle. Um, <laughs> well, the, on December 4th, the House of Representatives passed a new defense authorization bill which prohibits... Future use of RD-180 engines. No more RD-180s. Asterisk, asterisks. Yeah. Here are those asterisks. First, uh, RD-180s ordered as part of the bulk buy by United Launch Alliance mm -hmm. are still allowed. Of so course. there's this contract through 2019 that ULA has. Right. It allows them to you know, send up a bunch of um, Delta IV and Atlas V rockets. Right. They obviously need the RD-180s for the Atlas V. They can continue to purchase and acquire RD-180s for the Atlas V through 2019, which gives ULA a little bit of breathing room yeah. to work with Blue Origin or Aerojet Rocket Dime to develop a new engine for the Atlas V rocket, basically 2019, which actually says you must replace the RD-180 with a US-made system by 2019. Interesting that those two dates collide. Obviously, that was done on purpose. Right. Um, there's also a waiver for the uh, for the engines for national security missions. Hmm. So if we cannot find a non RD one eighty engine right. to launch a military payload that is important for national security, they can still use the RD one eighty if there's no alternate available. I think you misspoke. I think you meant for uh, viewing crops. For yeah, for viewing crops, crop crop analysis. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Want to make sure we're still saying the same things. <laughs> exactly. For for no, that'd be in China. No, we, we <laughs> no, we're we're a little bit different here. We're like, here's a classified payload. Watch it go up. Isn't it beautiful? We're not going to tell you what it does, but isn't it beautiful? Yeah. So uh, they can still use the RD-180 for that. So it yeah. sounds like Russian engines are being phased out slowly, kind of, sort of, maybe. <laughs> well, that's how that's going. In a way. Um, Boeing has completed the CCT cap milestone. Yay, go Boeing. Uh, yeah, the ground segment critical design review for the CST-100 uh, has been done. The three-week-long review covered Boeing's plans for construction or constructing and processing its crew space transportation system, uh, former orbiter processing facility at Kennedy Space Center, also known as KSC, and also converted the development of the nearby mission control center and there it is in all of its animated glory <laughs> is it, right the CS, well cst is the cruise space transportation system that's what that's that's what that stands for right yeah okay just wanted to make sure I'm or still... csd crew C S crew, crew space, space transportation, transportation system. system csd 100 csd 100 there you go yep. system now equals 100 <laughs> um um, all right, why don't we do this? Uh, let's take a quick, you know, before we go into break, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the moon mail because this is just kind of a fun campy story. Sure. Um, it's just a fun go into break, uh, kind of story. So nice. if you want to send, how would you, you're, Billy Mays here. <laughs> <laughs> Betty H here. How would you like you to go. send something to the moon? How much would you expect to pay? $10 billion, $5 billion for the low, low price of $460. One time payment. You can send a, a one half by 0.1 inch capsule. So it's pretty tiny, but you can send a capsule to the moon using moon mail over at moonmail.co. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is pretty freaking awesome. Um, yeah. You can do uh, uh, three quarters of an inch by 0.1 inch for $820, one inch by 0.1 inch for $1,600. And if you, if 0.1 inch is tall, because 0.1 inches is not very tall. Yeah. If you need a lot more room, you can actually, there's a little slider. If you go to the little purchase yeah. page, slide it to the right, and you can get that up to like 12,000 some odd dollars. 
And, uh, something like that. Yeah, but you can actually send something to the moon. This is going to go, uh, this is astrobotics when they're going to um, put a capsule on a lander mm -hmm. kind of thing, rover, mm -hmm. and they're going to drop it off at the moon. And you're going to put all these things in there, just mm -hmm. drop it off. And so you're going to have kind of this time capsule of stuff uh, over at the moon. The seed, so, there you go. Yeah. Really uh, interesting. So if you want more information, like I said, moonmail.co, not However, .com. Not uh, no remains. No they, remains. They that's right. Do the ashy thing. Yeah, that's if you want to do that, Celestis, if you want to do the remains. Yes. Um, uh, there's no mention of when they will put the capsule on the moon, but uh, sometime in the future. And if you want it. your DNA, go with Lunar Mission One. We have all these options. So many options for putting. So many options. Basically, for we want to litter the moon, the moon with DNA. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we, we want to throw our litter on the moon. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and instead of talking about the moon, we're going to talk about Mars. We've got Boss Lonsdorp, Boss Lonsdorp, the go. founder and CEO, co-founder and CEO of Mars One, joining us next. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview uh, with Mars One, I wanted to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this episode go. These are the people who've contributed at least $5 to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show and every single dollar helps. You can find more information on how to contribute to the show over at patreon.com slash tm. R -O. All right, we've talked about them a lot on the show. Uh, they're trying to do some pretty awesome things. We've got Boss Lonsdorp from Mars One. He is the CEO and uh, co-founder of Mars One joining us live. Boss, thank you for taking the time. It's like 10 o'clock your time, so thank you very much. 10 o'clock p.m. your time. Thank you for taking the time. You're welcome, Ben. It's a pleasure to be on the show. So let's start off at the beginning. I know a lot of people... Um, uh, it, in, in the show know who Mars One is, but maybe there's some new viewers. Could you describe what is Mars One? Um, Mars One is a not-for-profit organization that's working on establishing the first human outpost on Mars in 2025. A very ambitious timeline that's possible because we are uh, quite uniquely a mission of permanent settlement, which is a very polite way of saying it's a one-way trip. So people we send to Mars are going to stay there. That's, that's not a small ambition, that's, that's a very big idea. How did you come up with this idea? Uh, I started Mars One because I wanted to go to Mar my, Mars myself. Uh, that's 17 years ago. Uh, I still want to go to Mars, uh, but I will not be in one of the first crews because uh, the, I'm not the right type to be on that first crew. And uh, it's my belief that for Mars One, our biggest challenge is not in finance, it's not in technology, but it's in finding the right crew for the first mission. And I'm definitely not one of those people. Why is that? So actually, I think that's something that isn't talked a lot about on any of these shows is the first crews who go to Mars, it is like a permanent camping trip for them. Uh, there is no infrastructure out there. There is nothing. Can you describe what it's going to be like for those first settlers on Mars? Well, there, it's, it's not as if there is absolutely nothing. Before the first crew goes, Mars One will establish a uh, habitable settlement. So there will be an outpost uh, that's ready to inhabit waiting for the first crew. Um, but they are the, the, the only four humans on a planet. I mean, imagine how, how difficult it is to, to live in such conditions. Uh, it's a habitable outpost, but it's not going to be luxurious. It's going to be real... Uh, real settlement, real exploration, just like in the old days when people explored, they took a step into the future because they were finding new world, new lands, but they were also taking a step back uh, in time because they were uh, they were going to a place with, le with, with less comfort than they were used to. So it's going to be tough, especially for the first crew. Uh, the second crew will be joining the first crew, so there will already be eight people uh, on Mars, so they will have a little bit easier lives, and after that life will be less and less difficult on Mars, but it's always going to be, for, for the first couple of decades, it's going to be a lot tougher than life on, on Earth. And why is now the right time for Mars One? What, what makes now the right time to start this program? 
Well, a number of things have happened uh, recently. Uh, there's the, uh, the, the the internet and all the social media platforms that uh, really uh, took a great rise in the last uh, decade. And that makes it possible to make this not a, a Dutch mission or a, or a US mission or a Russian mission, but mankind's mission to Mars. We want to involve the entire world in doing this. And we're quite successful at that. We've been uh, in the news in every single country in the world, I think. And we're receiving donations from more than 100 different countries. So we're, we're already very international. So that's one, the, the, the internet. Another thing is uh, actually the economic decline. I think that in the pre-2008 world where everything was uh, lined in gold, it would have been a lot harder to, to do this because if everything is good, then you're not so worried about the next step. And so I believe that that's also something. Yeah? The, the fact that there are problems in the world and people realize that makes it more um, important to do a mission like this. And then there's the, uh, the, uh, the rise of the, of the private space companies. Uh, companies like, for example, SpaceX that offer much more affordable access to space, uh, other small uh, aerospace companies that uh, that are already building things for NASA and are doing that at a bet much better cost than some of the established aerospace companies. All these things help. And finally, the uh, the decrease in spending by the regular space agencies make the very big and established aerospace companies more um, open and maybe even um, more, uh, uh, and they, they kind of have to work together with uh, with companies like Mars One uh, that have ideas that are a little bit more out of the ordinary, if I say it politely. Well, you're going to need some ideas out of the ordinary. Uh, you know, one of the critiques we've had of Mars One is that to date we haven't landed anything of large size. Other, I mean, Curiosity is as big as we've gotten on Mars. And that was 900 kilograms was the landed rover itself, which is about uh, 1, 000, just under 2,000 pounds or so for those of you in the U.S. That's the biggest thing we've ever put on Mars. How are you going to get something that is going to be able to sustain humans on the surface of Mars? Well, that's, this is actually the most important reason why a mission of permanent settlement is so much less complex. And my CTO never allows me to say simpler, but less complex. Uh, than a return mission because for a human mission uh, our our building block is about two and a half metric tons so we have a, a, a life support system that has a useful payload of about two and a half metric tons a living unit that has a useful payload of about two and a half metric tons that's our building block and that's uh, it's more than curiosity rover but it's nothing compared to what nasa wants to land on mars for the return mission so they they need to land return rockets um, Furthermore, uh, Curiosity was landed at about uh, two kilometers uh, altitude uh, compared to the Martian uh, zero that uh, humans have defined. Uh, and we will be landing at about minus four kilometers altitude, uh, which gives us another six kilometers of, uh, first of all, air pressure. Uh, so we have a, th a thicker atmosphere in which we can land a higher payload, but also more time, uh, uh, which allows us to take, uh, to be more uh, um, to, to have, we have less risk because we have more time to, uh, to land uh, after uh, entering the atmosphere. So there's a number of reasons why uh, permanent settlement, uh, but also our location, make it relatively comparable to, to Curiosity. Yeah, the Curiosity could have been a lot heavier if they would have landed it at minus four kilometers altitude. But you're still, I mean, you're talking about uh, still about twice the weight of Curiosity which we've never done before. Is there any plan to figure out how you're gonna land? E even if you're at a higher altitude, that's still, uh, you know, you're talking about the Martian a atmosphere. It's just thick enough to be a problem, but too thin to be very useful. So how are you gonna deal with that? Um, well, first of all, it's a little bit less than a factor of two. The, uh, the Curiosity rover could probably been a, have been about 13 or 1400 kilos if it was landed at minus four kilometers altitude. Uh, but it's still a step, but it's actually a much smaller step than the step from the Mars Exploration Rovers to the Curiosity Rover. That was more than a factor of two. So it's actually uh, not a step that, uh, that's uh, something that we've never done before. We've discussed this with, uh, with experts from NASA, also with experts from Lockheed Martin. And we're planning to, uh, to have this uh, work done by Lockheed Martin, who's already under contract for our first unmanned mission in 2018. 
uh, and they are the most experienced private uh, company, uh, a non non government co uh, entity work, and that have been uh, doing Mars landings. Uh, they've been involved in every single landing uh, on the surface of Mars in uh, one way or the other. Uh, so we we definitely have the right uh, supplier um, uh, inside for that. Now let's talk about the 2018 rover mission. Uh, what is that? Uh, it's it's not a rover mission. It's a static platform that we will land in uh, in 2018. It's uh, it's our first unmanned mission, and it's uh, if we are successful in if we are successful in pulling that off, it's the first private um, landed mission on the surface of Mars. Uh, so far, NASA has been the only entity that has been successful in landing on Mars. So for us, this is an extremely important mission. We call it a demonstration mission. It will demonstrate uh, water extraction from the Martian surface. It will demonstrate uh, use of thin film solar panels. But I think that the most important thing it will demonstrate is actually Mars One. Uh, right now, we're a small Dutch not-for-profit organization. If we are successful in landing uh, a, a payload on Mars in 2018, then we are uh, next, in, next to NASA in, uh, in uh, Mars exploration, and that would be a huge step for us. So we, we're trying to keep the risk of that mission as low as possible. And for that reason, we've taken a platform that NASA has already used in uh, uh, 2007, the platform of the Phoenix lander. Uh, it was also built by Lockheed Martin. And we're installing our, um, our instruments on that platform. So we're taking the chassis of the, of the Phoenix mission and putting our own uh, our own uh, uh, car on top of that, our own uh, instruments. Then uh, this will be, uh, so it will be not the second time that this mission is flown, but actually NASA is building the InSight mission, the 2016 InSight mission, also on the same platform. So by the time uh, of uh, 2018, there will have been a track record of two missions with the same platform that have landed on Mars. So it will be the, actually the first mission that lands uh, on the same platform for the third time. So there's no better track record mission uh, um, planned for Mars, and that helps tremendously. But it's uh, uh, not, uh, Mars exploration is always risky, so even that mission will have risks, but we're keeping the risks as low as possible. And, and how does that lander mission help you get humans on Mars? What is that step? Well, there's actually um, three important aspects to that. First, it's a, a technology demonstration mission, so we'll demonstrate water extraction and thin film solar panels. Both are extremely important for uh, human survival on Mars. Then, as I already explained, it's a demonstration of Mars One. Uh, we need to establish ourselves uh, as a um, as an, a Mars exploring uh, entity. And the third one is that. Uh, by doing this, we will rally a lot of support from all over the world, because if we can do this, then we are worth supporting. So more and more people will join uh, the ranks to support mankind's mission to Mars, um, uh, Mars One. So we get humans on Mars. That first colony, while they're going to have some infrastructure there, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to immediately extract water from Mars for long-term living, I assume at least. They're not going to have food there, I assume. Uh, so how are they going to live off the land, per se? You know, we look at Biosphere 2, and that was a disaster. How are you going to avoid all of those types of problems on Mars? Uh, well, first I would like to correct you about Biosphere 2. Uh, Paragon Space Development Corporation was founded by some of the people who were in Biosphere 2. And in Biosphere 2, there were, there were problems, but that was to be expected. It was the first time that humans were going to live in an enclosed environment. And the goal of Biosphere 2 was not to, to find no problems and to be completely successful. The, the, the point was to find the, what are the problems when you close a, a biosphere. So it was actually extremely successful. And I think it's tremendous that they stayed inside uh, without any input of, of anything for two years. So uh, in my opinion, it was a huge success and a, a tremendous step forward in, in biosphere development. Um, the, the, the first humans will, uh, will find water uh, on Mars that has already been extracted by the systems uh, that they have on Mars. So there will be already water extraction from the water, oxygen will be produced. Uh, we will use the nitrogen from the Martian atmosphere to produce the inner part of the, of the atmosphere within the uh, habitat. So those um, resources will be, uh, will be mined from Mars from the start and will we'll demonstrate that capability even before the first humans leave Earth orbit, even before they leave uh, the planet itself. Um, food is a, is a different matter. We, we, will, uh, we will try to grow as much of the food as possible uh, locally. 
uh, probably in the first couple of years we will import the nutrients for the plants because um, it's, it's difficult to recycle the waste materials back into plant nutrients, uh, at least in the beginning. Uh, but they will try to grow as many plants as possible to support uh, their, uh, their, their own colony, uh, which is not just important financially, because every kilo that you send to Mars in our plan is about $100,000, uh, so it's really an expensive stake uh, if you bring it from Earth. Um, but it's also important for, their, uh, for the psychology. I mean, eating from a tin can for two years on Mars is not something that you want to do. You want to be eating a tomato and uh, other fresh uh, produce and it uh, connects uh, it connects the, the crew on Mars to uh, to nature to to Earth. So it's a, it's extremely important that they uh, try to grow their own food. But of course, there will be um, food rations, uh, storable food. Uh, even if no no plant ever grows on Mars, there will be storable food that supports them until the next supply mission arrives. And will they have to be vegetarians? Because uh, you're not going to really have meat on Mars, right? Uh, we'll certainly not be sending any cows or, uh, or pigs to Mars anytime soon. However, uh, they will probably have insects as part of their diet, um, which means that officially, uh, I believe, they're not vegetarians, because I don't believe that vegetarians are allowed to uh, eat insects. Uh, insects are, uh, um, in, in North America and Europe, they're not so uh, um, well known as a food source, but in most of the rest of the world, people eat insects uh, almost every day. Um, and it's an extremely interesting way to recycle some of the remains of the food that humans can't eat uh, immediately into a, a nutrient for humans. So uh, it's very likely that insects will be part of the diet. All right. So 10 years to get humans onto Mars is an extremely aggressive schedule. Uh, you know, there are not very many launchers capable of lifting large amounts of payloads on the planet today. Falcon Heavy has never flown. SLS has never flown. I mean, these giant rockets just don't exist today. Uh, how are you going to maintain that schedule? Well, it's an ambitious schedule, that's uh, for sure. Uh, however, if we compare it to the schedule of uh, Kennedy, uh, when he was uh, launching Man to the Moon, it's actually uh, a lot less aggressive. And when Kennedy said, uh, before the end of the decade, we all know the speech, uh, rockets, the American rockets were still exploding on the platform. So, uh, and there was no portable life support systems. There was almost nothing that they needed to go to the moon. Uh, so we're, we're in a lot better position than, uh, than uh, President Kennedy was back then, uh, but it's still an ambitious uh, uh, time schedule. Uh, the, for our 2018 uh, mission, we don't need a large launcher, a, a normal Falcon uh, rocket or any, almost every um, medium or heavy weight uh, launcher uh, could do the job. And Phoenix, uh, Phoenix went to Mars successfully, so it's, uh, that should be no problem. Um, for our uh, 2020 missions and all the uh, cargo and human missions after that, we will uh, we, we would like to use um, a Falcon Heavy or comparable size rocket. Uh, the, the first Falcon Heavy launch is, uh, is planned for uh, 2016, I believe. So that gives us another... F uh, we, we are able to have a four-year delay at SpaceX uh, before that brings us any trouble. So I believe that uh, the Falcon Heavy is definitely uh, a rocket that we will be able to use, and that's the that's actually the one that we are assuming we will be using in our uh, in our technical plan right now. Uh, the SLS would be another uh, possibility. Um, I I don't believe it will be um, price competitive to the Falcon Heavy, uh, but we're very interested in uh, in looking at the specs when uh, more is uh, known about that rocket. And my one question I have, and actually this has been brought up in the chat room as well, is how are you going to fund this? These rockets are expensive, spacecrafts are expensive. Uh, I mean, these things end up costing billions of dollars. Where does that money come from? Uh, we estimate the cost of our mission, so all the preparatory missions up to and including the first four humans on Mars, uh, at about six billion US dollars. So that's a lot of money. Um, the uh, Mars One has a number of uh, revenue models that will help us finance this mission. Uh, one, actually, I started Mars One when I found out what the value of a, an event, um, of an, a unique event is. I found the revenue numbers of the Olympic Games, and that's about four billion US dollars in three weeks of Olympic Games. So more than one billion per week just because the world is watching. That uh, triggered my um, that that triggered in me the possibility of financing this human mission to Mars. 
And we believe that uh, Human Mission to Mars is going to, going to be so big. It's going to be the biggest event, uh, the greatest adventure of mankind uh, yet. Uh, and we estimate, together with experts from the media industry, the value at between five and ten Olympic Games. So just the, the broadcasting rights and the sponsorships and partnerships, that's the revenues of the Olympic Games, that's already a good business case. Then there's intellectual property. We're going to uh, make good agreements with all our suppliers about sharing the uh, potential future revenues of intellectual property. Um, a third one is donations. Mars One is a not-for-profit organization and uh, from the start of our mission we've been um, receiving donations from people from all over the world right now from more than 100 different countries. Um, so uh, there's, there's a number of different revenue models, but the most important way that we will finance this mission is actually through investments because most of these revenue models will be, uh, will be very valuable in uh, 10 years time when the first humans leave. Uh, and even more so when the first humans land. Uh, so investments are the most important way of making this happen in the, in the short and medium uh, term. Uh, we already have a number of investors in Mars One, uh, of course not in the not-for-profit foundation because that's, it's not possible to give uh, investors a return on their investment. So the, uh, we've, uh, we have a, a for-profit entity that holds all the media rights and the intellectual property rights. And uh, in that, um, that for-profit entity, we already have a number of investors and we are currently in negotiation with uh, a number of investors and one of them is actually interested in financing our entire mission. So there's a lot of interest in our business model, a lot of interest from investors to participate in that. Yeah, you mentioned using the Olympics as kind of a baseline model of you know, looking at that and going, oh, wow, there's something here. Uh, actually, one of our uh, viewers, Tyler, asked, uh, when will Mars One begin their television show? Uh, in other words, when are you going to start to televise some of this stuff? Um, we, uh, we're currently actually, uh, actually uh, last Monday we started the uh, round two interviews with all our candidates. And uh, that's uh, something that's already being recorded. It's, uh, it's remote interviews, but we are recording every single interview. Um, and we're expecting that after the summer of 2015, uh, we will start a documentary series around the astronaut selection. So, of course, it will, uh, it will focus on Mars One, what's, what's our plan. Uh, it will give uh, more details uh, for, uh, for a lot of people in the world who have uh, not heard a lot about it. And it will focus on how do you select the right people for this job? How do you select people that can leave everything be behind and go to Mars? So. Um, I believe that it will be uh, after the summer of 2015. If we're really lucky, it might be before, but I don't think that will happen. Uh, and actually, speaking of details, uh, Noah Tron from Twitter also asks, uh, you're, well, he says you're deliberately vague on mission of architecture specifics. When do you plan on releasing information? So Mars One has made uh, a, a technical plan that, uh, that can be done with existing technology, and we've uh, we've discussed that plan with major aerospace companies. Here we have Lockheed Martin and Paragon under contract, uh, but we've discussed it with several other aerospace companies uh, for each of their components. Um, and we've received feedback from their business developers and engineers. Uh, and we know that we have a plan that can be done with existing technology. However, the, the plan that we currently have is probably not the best plan. So we're, and we, for example, we have uh, Paragon Space Development on, under contract for uh, the life support systems and the suits, uh, that, uh, the life support on Mars and the suits on Mars. Um, and we have given Paragon the ideas that we had, but we know that Paragon with their decades of, um, of uh, experience, they can do a much better plan. So we plan to release all the details of our plan when our suppliers have finished their first studies, such that we don't release plans and get a lot of feedback from people with uh, potential improvements uh, on a plan that's actually already under improvement. So when the uh, conceptual design studies of our suppliers are finished, uh, then we will release uh, public versions of those conceptual design studies that people can uh, look at, that people can give feedback on, and that uh, we hope uh, they can even suggest uh, improvements for. Do you have a rough yeah. guesstimate? I mean, a non-committing guesstimate of, well, we think it'll take about a year or we think it'll take about four years. Any ideas? Uh, well, it depends on the component. So uh, Paragon is uh, probably wrapping up their uh, concept study on the suits and the life support uh, by the end of February. So I hope that by half March or something like that, we will have 
uh, the, uh, the public report that is, uh, and we need approval from the State Department of the US uh, to release such uh, information because of ITAR. Um, but by half March, it should be possible to have, um, to have the public report on that component. Uh, and for other components, it will be a lot longer. For example, the transit habitat, which we will, which we will fly in 2024. Uh, well, I don't expect that we will have the mission concept study ready before something like 2018, uh, because there's simply no need of investing in the uh, transit habitat before that date. Um, but perhaps we will, perhaps, for example, our investor might uh, demand from us that we have the mission concept study uh, ready at some point in time, then it might be sooner. But um, uh, so it really depends on the component that uh, we're discussing. One last question, uh, and, and that goes to some of the detractors uh, against Mars One. Um, ten years ago, SpaceX, people were looking at what Elon was trying to do, and they, they laughed at him, right? You, you're, you can't build a rocket company for this amount of money. You can't build, right? This, this is what governments do. A private entity can't do this. And today, they're one of our better chances of getting humans on Mars. What do you think your turning point for the detractors will be? Uh, is there an event where you'll go, oh, people are taking us seriously now, you know, we're really doing this thing? Uh, well, I think that's, uh, that's a continuous process and more and more people are being won, out, won over by uh, the progress that we are making. Uh, I think that uh, last year we contracted Lockheed Martin, uh, which was for a lot of people uh, a, a, a signal, oh, wow, these guys are really onto something. Um, I think that... Uh, the, the big investment that we uh, expect to, uh, to attract sometime soon, uh, that will be a, a big one that will convert more people into our, uh, into our, um, into our field. Uh, but of course, I, the, I think the biggest one uh, will be the first unmanned mission that we do in 2018. But I think there's also going to be people that will not believe that we can actually do it until there is actually humans on the planet. And I even believe that when that is all done, there will still be people that say that we're filming this somewhere in Arizona. Uh, so uh, it's a continuous process, and I think we're already uh, on the right track. And what, what we find is that when people take the time to really listen to us and to listen to the details, uh, they, they understand that, um, that we are actually already a lot further ahead and we have a more realistic plan than many people think. And I think, Ben, that you uh, were definitely one of those people. Um, and, and that's also uh, our, our fault. Eh? We are to blame for that. Perhaps our communication should be better. But um, it's difficult to, to divide your time between communication and actually getting the mission done and then choosing for communication. So it's, uh, uh, communication is always an issue. We'll, we'll do our best to do it better. Um, and we'll keep converting people uh, into believers uh, and supporters of our mission. Well, I thank you so much for taking time out of your night to uh, show up and, and talk about what you're doing and uh, some of the technical issues and, and thoughts that we had about uh, what it will take. Um, I, I don't know if you'll be able to do it in 10 years. I think that's an overly aggressive timeline. But if you can find the funding, you seem to have the passion. And that's one of the key elements to actually changing the world is having the passion and the drive to do it. Uh, and you certainly have that. So uh, thank you so much. Hopefully you won't be a stranger to the show. We'll be able to bring you on in the future. Thanks a lot, Ben. It was really a pleasure to be on the show. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, when we come back, comments from our last show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. So old Bill in the chat room says, wait, we're going back to the moon one piece at a time. That's with the... Uh, the <laughs> I also had a theory that, uh, you know how in Battlestar Galactica, this has all happened before and it'll happen I'll again. happen again. Yeah. So what if the moon is actually just a bunch of our ashes? Because we all got really super excited about it. <laughs> it's just, the moon really just is a past generations. Okay, sorry. That was a thought. All right. Uh, before we get started with comments from our last show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow. 
who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode go. These are the people who've contributed at least $3 to this specific episode, which means they're also going to get early access to After Dark, which is the unscripted show after the show. What, wait, there's more. You can also uh, contribute a dollar, easy for me to say, uh, to, uh, to tomorrow. And uh, these are the people, one dollar, you get um, your name in the show, you get access to the Google Hangout, some pretty cool stuff, all these different reward levels for each different section of the show. You can find more information on how to help crowdfund this show over at patreon.com slash tmro. If you liked the Mars One interview, uh, if, you, if you thought it was good, you know, whether you agree or disagree, Exactly. You know, we, we were talking um, a little bit in between breaks with some of the people talking about how, um, you, you know, you, you've got SpaceX and 10 years ago, most people didn't think that they'd be able to do anything. It was, right. you know, we, I mentioned that a little bit in the show, you know, it was, it was um, uh, the domain of governments to do yeah. this stuff. It wasn't the domain of private space. And we had seen private space attempt it before and fail time after time after time. But it only takes one person with the drive and ambition to change the world. And um, maybe it's Mars One. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But it is possible. It is possible. Mm -hmm. So, all right, let's go ahead and get on uh, with some of the uh, comments from last week. This first one is from at Teddy Hearsey. Uh, SLS is not a rocket to nowhere, but a rocket to everywhere. Boeing has shown their plans to Mars and other places, too. Well, kind of. Hashtag. Hashtag. Um, SLS is not a rocket to everywhere. Um, it's, well, I, I think, so yeah. It's funny because somebody else on YouTube said uh, basically the same thing, but they said, it's not a rocket to nowhere. It's a rocket to anywhere. It isn't. So, the, sure, all right, the rocket goes, but what are you going to bring with it? So you can put Orion on it? Okay, so we put Orion on the top. Orion has an active lifespan of 21 days. Right. So it's a, ro it's a rocket that can put a spacecraft anywhere as long as it doesn't have to go further than 21 days out. That's not getting you to Mars. Right. Uh, that does get you to the moon. So sure. basically it's a rocket to anywhere right outside our door. Now you can, for those watching the show, like they're, they're, I can hear them writing the YouTube comments right now. Yeah. It does. You can take Orion longer than 21 days. Orion actually can, with a HAB module, go six months uh, so you can extend the life of Orion sure. using a HAB module that is not funded or designed at this time. Okay. Right. So we could do it maybe in the future, but that's not currently actually designed or planned. Okay. So maybe we'll go to Mars. Maybe we'll go to an asteroid as long as it's 21 days away. So, all right, you're right. You said space launch system, not a rocket to nowhere, but a rocket to everywhere. So we can get the rocket to anywhere we want to go, but what are we putting on it? Right. In the chat room, they say uh, SLS can't land anywhere, and somebody <laughs> said, well, SLS can land on the sun. Uh, well, it can crash into the sun, <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I'm not saying SLS is bad. Right. Uh, and, and the general kind of... Uh, actually, you know what? Um, the next comment kind of outlines this a little bit, this next thought fairly well. So uh, this comment comes from at Asomer1, okay. I think Astronomer1. Sure. Uh, Joseph says... Wouldn't it be cheaper in the long run to have a more universal vehicles rather than building a unique one for each mission? Hashtag, hashtag, hashtag SLS. SLS. Uh, so the idea being right now you build um, a heavy vehicle that's kind of designed to send things to Mars. Right. And you, so you've got Delta, Atlas, Space Launch System. You've got uh, Falcon, Falcon Heavy, all these different vehicles. Wouldn't it be more cost effective just to kind of have one core vehicle that can do anything. Sure. And that is what the space shuttle was supposed to be. One core vehicle could do anything. It was going right. to be the bus into space. Right. Turns out when you try to do stuff like that and you try to make one thing that could do everything, it ends up being really expensive and it's a jack of all trades and a master of none. There you go. And so uh, you end up with this kind of behemoth of a vehicle that can't really do anything very well right. and doesn't really have any function at that point right so building sls designed to be able to go anywhere okay great but we haven't put any thought into anything else around it right. so what's the point now i'm again i'm not saying sls is bad i'm what i'm saying is we, we've put the cart before the horse here we need mm. to decide look we're putting humans on mars right uh, i would like 
orb the moon. Pick something. I don't anything. Pick anything. And that is that is what we will then design SLS to do. Right. Maybe it's capable of doing more. Sure, right? You design SLS, it goes to the moon, it puts Orion on the moon. Awesome, we set up more than flags and footprints on the moon, permanent satellite. Great. SLS can still capable of going to Mars. Right. But we do the moon stuff first. We have a plan and then we take that and we move it over to Mars. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we skip the moon and we do Mars. Whatever you want to do, there just needs to be a plan. But right mm -hmm. now we're building a rocket and we're building a spaceship and then we're not going to do anything with it. And that seems like a giant waste of money. Agreed. Keep in mind, Orion has basically two missions on the books. Right. One of them is now done. The next mission is the, uh, right? right, is Exploration yeah. Mission 1. Yeah. And after that, there is no more use for Orion. Th that's the dirty little secret behind Orion. Two missions. That's it. Everyone's like, oh, well, we'll go back to the moon. That is not on the books. We'll go to Mars. We'll send humans to Mars. Not on the books. So that's what needs to happen. We need to decide that we're going to do this. All right. I, I super soapbox there. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, but I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, not sorry. Actually, we're going to skip the next comment and go to the last YouTube comment, if we could, Dada. Um, and this is from uh, Nios. And I want everyone to understand that this was part of a conversation. So yes. this, this is kind of taken slightly out of context, but still the meaning is, still shines through. Uh, says, I don't really get why they, meaning Ben and I, uh, would make it Twitter only, meaning comments. Uh, you can still do the fancy Twitter things without excluding all other social media. There's just no way to add any nuance in 140 characters. Getting pictures to show up is not worth paying that price, in my opinion. Yeah, that's as correct. As in getting your avatar to show up. Uh, that right, because you notice there was no avatar with this, right? Because it's right uh, because it's YouTube. That, and that screen was closer than I thought. <laughs> well, uh, bam! Uh, yeah, I just did that. <laughs> um, you're not wrong, uh, and I wanted to explain to the community. I did actually explain in a very long post yes. on YouTube exactly why we're doing Ironically, this. Ironically, yes. Um, but you should have made everything, every comment 140 pages. I should have. That would have been awesome. Sorry. But anyway. uh, I did want to explain to the community why we're doing this. Uh, first is YouTube forces you into 140 characters, which means Twitter it is... Twitter does. Twitter. Twitter. Sorry. Okay. Twitter forces you into 140 characters, which means that you have to be concise with your thoughts and be very... Uh, good about conveying your idea quickly and easily, which you means... You need to boil down your thoughts to 140 characters. Right, which is hard, but it means that it's super easy for us to then reconvey your thoughts in whole to the community. You, you'll notice sometimes we'll have the, like a page worth of text, and it's really, really hard for us to convey those ideas. I don't want to say it's impossible, but it is... It is woefully difficult. By forcing you into 140 characters, you force and condense the thought down to its core idea, right. and that we can convey very easily. Mm -hmm. It just makes for a better show and a better segment. That's part one. Part two, uh, we do want to start doing more social interaction with the community, and we have to choose a place to start. We'll eventually expand this out to more than just Twitter, sure. but we're choosing to start with Twitter. So for the foreseeable future, Twitter is where we're going to be. And um, it's going to be for the comments in the show, as well as in 2015 when we release what we're calling, what's called our social CG platform. That's an internal name. It doesn't impact you at all. That's what's going to add the banners at the bottom. So as we're having the show live and you're talking about us, we'll be able to pop those up on the screen. It's going to be very, very cool. Uh, YouTube doesn't really have any hooks to let us in to do those cool things. Yeah. It's missing the development kits that allow us to go in and start scraping that and doing it on a, a per episode basis kind of like this. So I don't foresee that ever happening with YouTube unless Google changes how YouTube commenting system works. That I, that I don't see that as happening, but maybe. But we, I am planning on adding Facebook in the future as well as the live IRC chat room so that as you're chatting in the live room, we'll be able to pr bring those comments up. If you type on Facebook and you add your questions in the show, we'll bring those up. Twitter will bring those up. The one that will, the two that will be excluded will be Google Plus and YouTube. Not because we want to exclude them, but because we are we have to, because they just don't have the same tools that we need to be able to tie them into the show. At least not today, or I'm not aware of them. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, the other point behind uh, all of this is that from a YouTube standpoint, when you comment, it's stuck in the YouTube show. Yeah. So that one episode, you comment on that episode. That's great, and you've made that comment, and there are some amazing conversations that happen on YouTube. Those should not stop. Continue to have those conversations. That's great. They're not going to appear up here, for the most part. I mean, I'll bre every rule can be broken, right? But for the most part, they won't be appear up here, but those conversations are great, and other people answer. I will answer. There can be conversation there. 
but it's stuck in YouTube. No one else can really discover it. When you tweet on Twitter mm -hmm. and you add your comments on Twitter with a hashtag TMRO, everyone in your timeline can see that, for mm -hmm. better or worse. Mm -hmm. And people might go, what is this TMRO thing? What's this tomorrow thing all about? Mm -hmm. And they might, might be able to discover us through that other social media aspect mm -hmm. that they wouldn't have been able to do if you'd made that same comment on YouTube instead. Right. So it helps us with discovery. So you're helping the show actually get seen by more people. Maybe they love it, maybe they hate it, whatever. But that, that helps us there as well. So that's why we're choosing Twitter and then eventually Facebook uh, right now. Um, that could change in the future. This could be all for naught. I don't know. I'm okay with changing things up, but I wanted you guys to understand the thought process behind choosing just Twitter. Does not mean you shouldn't comment on Facebook. Doesn't mean you shouldn't comment on the website. Use whatever social platform you want to use. And by the way, if you make an epic and amazing comment, like last week we had this great comment on our Reddit uh, chat about uh, women in STEM, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to air it, right? I mean, but it, uh, it has to be like truly fantastic, just like so amazing that I would be stupid not to bring it into the show. And um, let's, be, let's be blunt, most comments are not at that level. So if you want the highest probability of making it up onto the screen and into this segment, hashtag TMRO on Twitter, mm -hmm. that's what's going to do it. So, all right. Um, I wanted to get on that particular soapbox just for a minute so everyone understood. There is one last show in 2014 on December 20th. We will not be doing any more shows in 2014, and then we will return... Um, I think it's January 7th is our first show. Give me a calendar really quick. Uh, January... You can't... You, I can't. You 10th. January 10th will be our sh first show in 2015. And January is going to be a little bit spotty. So there may only be one or two shows in January. So one more show in 2014. Then we come back early January. And um, we're hoping to have some... Uh, well, I'm not going to ruin the, too much of the surprise, but... Um, uh, it'll be a little uh, Kerbal-based, hopefully, on January 10th. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank all of you so much for watching. Uh, join us next week, and After Dark is up next.